Welcome you back to the School of Christ television program. We're dealing with some very serious thinking in these lessons at this time because we live in some very, very serious times. God warned us that the night was coming when no man could work. Well, while there's light, we must work. Now, in our lesson to you last, we dealt with a final shaking showing that God is shaking the church now. The heavenly is being shaken. And the reason, so that there be nothing left in that church but that which is of God. Now, today we're going to come to this lesson, A New Beginning. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, and verse 1 and 2. A New Beginning. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, the ultimate fullness of all things. Now, I trust you've seen the two things that comprehend this letter. Now, in, in times past, there have been fragments, pieces, bits, aspects. But now all that and much more is gathered up together in completeness. There's no more different portions, no more different times, more no different ways. But now there's one time and one way. No matter what the ecumenical, the user-friendly, or the purpose-driven say, there is one way. It's all here. Fullness is reached. And this is the other time, the ultimate time of fullness, completeness. Now, this letter to the Hebrews brings us to the ultimate fullness of all things in the Son, not only fullness, ladies and gentlemen, but finality. This is the end of all God speaking. There's nothing beyond Christ. God who did speak. In those many ways, forms, method, has spoken fully and finally, there's nothing beyond this. I do not know what you're looking for, what you're expecting. Religion has brought a lot of foolishness to mind. But I'm telling you, God has given us all that you could ever ask to pray for. It is present. It is now. Revelation now and henceforth is not new truth. It is only light on the truth who is Jesus Christ. Now move into chapter 12 and pick up our governing words, the two words <clears throat> running right through the New Testament, chapter 12, verse 18, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempests, but you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. Listen to it. For you have not come. Then what? But you are come. Now here in verses 18 to 22, we have gathered up all that has been. It is very comprehensive, and all of that is ruled out with this word, not. Then verse 22, there's the introduction of another great order of things, wonderful beyond our imagination. Now, it is this great divide between what was uh, uh, in the Old Testament and what is now with Christ. We're at this time concerned with what we have come to in the advent of Christ and His cross. Now, what we have come to and what we are. God's intervention, intervention, rather, a divine act. Now, here in chapter 12, within these verses, is a great divide between what was and what is as consecrate, consecrated in this one letter. Now, the particular meaning is that all that lies on the two sides of the cross is concentrated in this letter to the book of Hebrews. You'll notice that under the knot, you're not come to, but under that knot, you have the constituting of the former Israel. See, we're taken right to Mount Sinai. You know, and at Mount Sinai, when they come out of Egypt, Israel was constituted a nation. They were a people. They're a mixed multitude. But here at Sinai, they become a nation. 
They were Hebrews made into Israel. Now, this is something new in history, new among the nation, something new in the world. It's a new beginning of God, God's act, God's doing. We have it all right there. It's God taking the initiative, and the people Israel is a result of divine intervention in the history of the Word of God. A new beginning, that is the old. Then we come into the new, and the new opens with the gospel by John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, notice that. In the beginning, God. But there is another movement. A new creation is here indicated and is described. In the beginning, God created man. But here in John, a new humanity, a new mankind, is brought into view under a not and a but, which was born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, as the people of God, we're born that way. You're never born a Christian by your mother. You're never born naturally a child of God. You never get to be that by going to church. We're born of God, a miracle of miracles. We are God's acts created in righteousness and true holiness. It's God's act that produced a new mankind, a new and different humanity, never produced by the will of man. Not a natural race, but a spiritual race. And the Bible said Jesus Christ, as a man, was the firstborn of that race. What then is the implication of this letter and of the New Testament as a whole? What is it? A new Israel. Not those Hebrews of history. A new Israel has come in. Now, this is not replacement theology. The old Israel is going to come in, and many thousands of them have. Now, wherever the name Christ is mentioned in the Amplified Version, it's always linked with Messiah. They are put together. They're one because Messiah is the Hebrew, which Christ is the Greek, meaning the same, the Lord's anointed. Now, the Christ is the Messiah. Now, the Messiah, in the history of Hebrew mentality, the Messiah of the old Israel is the Christ of the new Israel. Now, this is a new act of God. A new act of God is the Messiah, the Christ. And a new act of God is the new Israel. And there, and there are two governing features and factors in this new Israel as an act of God. One is the resurrection of Christ, God's act. The resurrection of Christ is God's specific act in history. Now, but then the other aspect of this act of God is Pentecost. It is the intervention of God by the third person of the Trinity, the intervention of God in history to bring us from death and to empower this new race. It is God producing and empowering a new kind of humanity, the growing light, increasing understanding of this new dispensation. Dispensation. Now, coming back to the New Testament, and especially to the book of Acts, what have you? The gradual dawning upon the apostles and then upon the believers of what has happened and of what the meaning of Christ was. Listen closely. Notice, in the beginning, they still continue to go to the temple, the time of prayer at the temple, in the ordinance of the temple, the ritual of the temple. They're still going up. But something, something is happening. Something is spreading over their sky that fades out. Now, they're losing that attachment. Notice all the way through. They're losing that attachment. They're losing that mentality. They're meeting in homes. They're meeting wherever they can. They're not meeting in that temple any longer. You see, when you notice, it's not a sudden thing. That happens so they can make a sudden break. It's the dawning of the meaning of this new day. It's so real. 
that they do not put it into a system of teaching and say, you must come out of that denomination, you must leave that system. No, no, no. It's just happening. Something is happening, and they're finding themselves out. First, it was an inward separation. They find themselves out before they're out. No one told them they have to leave the system. Something is happening on the inside. In the old creation, God began on the outside. In the new, always from the inside. Now, in the spiritual dispensation, often you find yourself somewhere, perhaps where you never intended to be. Peter never intended to be in the house of Cornelius. That was totally against him. No, Lord, not so. That, that was his response to that sheet. Peter does not know what has happened to him, but he's going to know. Later, he'll write about the spiritual house of God. It is a new day. The dawn has come in. The light is growing. This, that is the first movement. This is an organic thing. It's a movement of life within us. It's not the rules of religion. It's not legal. You must or you must not. You must leave this or that in order to come to God's fullness. It's not that at all. It was and is from the inside. It's a separation unto God by life. It's a way of the Holy Ghost the initiative of God, the dawning of a new beginning. Amen. That, that something is happening to me because it's happening to me. Not because some religious organization said it. Not some cult. But it's happening because it's happening to me. It is a spiritual movement because this is a spiritual dispensation that began at the beginning of the book of Acts. And when you are through with that book, what will you find? That the light has been growing and growing and growing. That's what you find. Now, the growing revelation of what has happened, of, of what the resurrection of Christ and the advent of the Holy Spirit really meant, it's a growing revelation, not of some new thing as a thing, but what was at the beginning at the root of all things. So what has happened, you understand, God is moving backward in order to move forward. And you, you, you have this growing revelation under these two words, not and but, what was and what is. This is an inward thing. The day is moving on. Now, it will come, we know, to a glorious climax. When what happened at the beginning is found in the consummation of the new Jerusalem coming down from above. The sum of this new thing that happened with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have all of the New Testament in mind when we speak of the growing light, increasing the understanding of what this new dispensation means. You'll have many exact statements in the growing light, which is grown from the day when Paul first encountered with Jesus. Paul did not have it all at once. You must understand, there were years of dealing with him. But it was growing all the time, and he'll say presently, the Jerusalem which is beneath is in bondage. Cast out the bondwoman, not that Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem which above, is above is our mother. You see the language and what it means. Now, the letter to the Galatians, along this line of contrast between what was and what is, see, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And right at the end of that letter, in Galatians 6, 16, Paul uses this phrase, the Israel of God, the whole Israel, the new Israel, that throws light on the whole letter. One Israel is gone. Now, that's the argument of the letter, and that's why Paul got into such trouble. That Israel is set aside, but now another 
with its headquarters above, a new Israel entirely. Now, this is the very vital point. We must recognize the new dimension of God is that that is that that has now come in on the positive side. You see, the tragedy of the old Israel is there having been set aside. The kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and shall be given to a nation, bringing forth fruit thereof. That's what Jesus said. Now, the tragedy of Israel is that they're dismissed from the dispensation or the dispensational movement of God. Now, this has lasted for 2,000 years. How much longer? We do not know. Probably not long. Looking at things today. They will recognize this Messiah as one that wounded in the house of his friends when we come back with him after the marriage supper. I don't know when, but I believe soon, very soon. God is doing a spiritual thing, not a temporal thing. In the sovereign activities of God, he's confounding and confusing all temporal representations of his heavenly kingdom. Men are trying to set up local churches after New Testament order. You've never had more confusion in local churches than you have today. Men t trying to set up Christian up things, trying to set up things. Men themselves, Christian movements, Christian institutions, Christian organizations, and they're all in confusion and do not know what to do with one another. But God is breathing upon every temporal representation in order to have a spiritual expression of Christ. That is the heart of what I'm telling you in this time. That church in this final day must come back to be in that representation through which Christ can be manifested. This, this is the very vocation of the church to be a revealer of the Christ. That God's Son came to be a revealer of God. The Bible says in Colossians that he was the express image of the invisible God. And the church is told in 1 John 4, 17, as he is, not was, but is in the world, so are we. We're to be here that through us there can come a manifestation of God. The new Israel is so much greater than the old because Christ, this Messiah, is so much greater than their conception of a Messiah. We have got to recognize the great dimension of the new Israel and resist exclusivism where Christ is concerned uh, as we would resist the plague. I'm not talking about fundamental truths and the personality of Christ. I'm talking about the greatness of this one who is introduced in Hebrews. God hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things. Hebrews 1 and 2. Now that's Paul's great word all the way through. All things, all things. And in the end, to sum up all things in Christ. So then we must understand the meaning of sonship. Now the governing concept of this letter is that God has spoken at the end of these times in Son. There's no article. In Son. The meaning of Son or Sonship is always fullness. Always. Now, you must lay hold to that. See, the fullness of the Father is the Son. The firstborn is the fullness and takes up all of that is of the Father and in the Father. Then we've said sonship is finality. Then as revealed through this letter, sonship and son is superiority. Using that word superiority in its right sense, the superiority of this so is forever settled in these words appointed heir of all things. Look at the catalog of things here. 
<coughs> superior to Moses, superior to Joshua. If Joshua had brought them into the rest, there'd been no more. He did not, therefore, he never reached finality. Superior to Angel, to Aaron, and all that system of priesthood, superior to the covenant, to all the sacrifice, how great is the sonship of Christ. The quest, see, is for right standing with God. You know, when you've read the word righteousness, what comes to your mind as to the meaning? Now, many have taught that in the Old Testament, the symbol of righteousness was brass. Well, I know you know brass is hard. It's cold. That's what the word has come to mean to most holiness people in the New Testament. But the amplified New Testament settles the issue. Wherever you find the word righteousness or justified in the amplified, you have this, a right standing with God. This has been the quest of humanity since the beginning. It does not matter where you go in the darkest heathenism or among the most ignorant, unlightened, the one deep down heartfelt desire of every human is to be in right standing with God. Going back to the beginning of the Hebrews, and here is this one, the Son. And the glorious thing about the Son is that He is in right standing with God. Everything before him was an attempt to get in right standing with God. It never did. It failed. But here is the Son, the beloved of the Father. This is my beloved Son. Could language express a more glorious right standing with God? The letter goes on to saying, say many, bringing many sons to glory, right standing with God is to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made you and I accepted in that beloved. That's Ephesians 1 and 6, a new beginning. This is where we are. There's nothing beyond, nothing beyond Christ. We're now coming to know Him and become, becoming conformed to that image in a spiritual and moral way. And this is God's answer to the confusion of our time. This is why the shaking that we talked about in our last message is taking place. Everything that's not Christ is shaken so that that church becomes that glorious church once more that Christ is going to return for. You see, the end is always contained in the beginning, and it always returns there. The church in the beginning was born of the Holy Spirit, full of the life of God, manifest in the life of God. On the day of Pentecost, they took knowledge. The Scripture said that they'd been with Christ, but that's, that's, that's a weak translation. Men, they saw Christ in those Holy Ghost-filled believers. God, help us to return to that. been wonderful to be with you today. Oh, I pray that God has talked to your heart. I, I ask nothing else but for God to talk, especially to that elect, that we, that we prepare for that moment of the coming of Christ and the final outpouring. Write me today. On the, on the web there, on the screen, you see everything you need to email us, write us, or call us. We want to hear from you. God bless you. We love you. I count it a very, very great privilege to be able to come to you five days a week on this wonderful gospel channel. You know, we're here London time at 9 a.m. every morning, 2.30 every afternoon, and 7 o'clock every evening. And I count it a tremendous privilege to be able to address the entire world through this gospel channel and the Internet and to bring this glorious, wonderful gospel of Christ. God said to us that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world before the end comes. Notice, he said, this gospel, not a gospel, not some delusion of man, but this gospel of the kingdom of Christ, bringing Jesus to the nations, has been 
the commission given to the church, the final commission of Christ, the final words of Christ, was to go you into all the world and preach this gospel to every, every single creature. Now, I believe with all of everything that is within me that you and I are the final generation. Perhaps judgment has already been passed upon the nation because a reprobate mind rules worldwide, almost exclusively that mind that has reached that point. A reprobate mind is that mind that calls good evil and evil good. We live in a time when we glorify homosexuality, we've murdered millions of babies, and, and it's, you're called something wrong with you if you don't believe that's what's to happen. See, we live in that kind of a time. We are the final generation. It was the final give up of God of Noah's day was a reprobate mind. Then came that flood. Well, we're beyond that. That flood of God's wrath called the tribulation is about to happen. But for the moment, the door is open for this gospel to be preached. I'm asking you to stand with me in prayer. 